We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Okay, so I wanted to first thank the uh, organizers really for this uh, kind invitation to um, join this cast of stellar uh, thinkers about the biology and <coughs> behavior of language. And um, I actually want to switch the title a little bit to something more specific. I want to talk to uh, you about uh, organization, in particular a kind of organization that I refer to as a taxonomy. And um, the organization that I'm um, uh, actually really referring to is the organization of sound, in particular speech sounds, and how those are actually processed in a very important part of the brain called uh, the superior temporal gyrus, uh, also known as Wernicke's area. Um, the main focus of my lab is actually to understand the basic transformation that occurs when you have an acoustic stimulus and how it becomes transformed into phonetic units. In other words, basically, how do we go from the physical stimulus that enters our ears into one that's essentially a mental construct, one that's a linguistic one? And to basically ask the simple question, what is the structure of that kind of information as it's processed in the brain? Now, um, this actually turns out to be a very um, complex problem because it's one that actually arises from many levels of computation that occur in the ascending auditory system. As sounds actually come through the ears, they go up through at least seven different uh, synaptic connections across many different parts of the brain, even bilaterally, uh, to where they're actually processed in the non-primary auditory cortex in the superior temporal gyrus. And what we know about this area from animal studies in non-human primates, for example, is that this is an area that no longer is tuned to basic low-level sound features like pure tones, uh, pure frequencies, but in one that is actually tuned to very broad, complex sounds. Uh, there have been very nice uh, work in fMRI that's actually demonstrated that this area is far more selective to complex sounds like speech over uh, non-speech sounds. So the basic question is not really about where is this processing going on. The question is how. OK, what is the structure of information in this transformation that's going on? And in particular, what kind of linkages can we make between that physical stimulus and the internal one, which is a phonetic one? For me, I think it's really important to acknowledge some really important fundamental contributions that occur um, that give us some insight and put them in uh, a, a very important perspective. For me, I think one of the most important pieces of work that led to this uh, work that I'm about to describe from our lab was actually 25 years ago. 
uh, using an approach that's actually far more complicated and difficult to achieve than what we do in our own work. Uh, this is using uh, single unit, single neuron recordings that were recorded from patients that were undergoing neurosurgical uh, procedures for their clinical routine care. And this very extremely rare but precious opportunity to actually record from certain brain areas while someone is actually recording, uh, listening to speech. And these are from my close colleague and mentor, uh, Dr. Ojeman, who's in, in the audience today. But why I think it's so important to acknowledge this work is a lot of the clues about what I'm about to describe were actually seen 25 years ago. And this figure that's extracted from that paper where they actually showed and could record from single brain cells called neurons in the superior temporal gyrus that they were, they were active and corresponding to very specific sounds. But if you actually look at where those sounds are, there's, um, they're not exactly corresponding to the same exact, let's say, phonemes or the same exact sounds. But in fact, they are corresponding to a class of sounds. This was an observation that was made in this paper. And they thought that, well, perhaps this is uh, some mention of a phonetic category representation there. But it wasn't that clear, actually. And there were a lot of other uh, really important observations that were made in that paper. Now, from a linguistic perspective, um, you know, in thinking about how behaviorally we organize this information in the brain, there's actually a wonderful way to approach it. It's not perfect, but a very wonderful way to think about how languages across the world actually share a, a similar and shared inventory of speech sounds. Not all completely the same. Each language has a different number, and, but they highly overlap. And the reason why they overlap is they, because they are produced by the same vocal tract. And this is essentially like a periodic table of sound elements for human language and speech. And so um, this table actually has two really important dimensions. The horizontal dimension is actually one that we call the place of articulation. It's referencing where in the vocal tract these sounds are made. For example, bilabial sounds, the P and the B, require you to actually have a transient occlusion at the lips, but you cannot make those sounds without that particular uh, articulatory movement. Whereas uh, some of the other sounds like a duh or a D or a T, a duh, a T, a duh, we call alveolar because the front of the tongue tip is actually placed against the teeth. And so these are actually referencing where occlusions are occurring in the vocal tract when we speak. And those actually correlate necessarily to very specific acoustic um, signatures. The other dimension is what we call the manner of articulation. And so the manner of articulation is actually telling you a little bit more about the not so much where, but how in the vocal tract the constrictions are made in order to produce those sounds. We have certain ones like plosives where you have complete closure of the vocal tract uh, and then transient release. Uh, other sounds where you have near complete, like a fricative, like sh, z, um, those sounds that we call fricative. And um, if you actually look at uh, vowels, vowels, they actually have a similar uh, structural organization. There actually is something that actually references where in the vocal tract, either the front, middle, or back, or uh, the degree of open enclosure. So for both consonants and vowels, there actually is a structure that we know about linguistically and phonologically about uh, how these things are, are organized. I think the thing that, that interests me is that, like I referenced before, that this is something like a periodic table, is that there is something fundamental about these units to our ability to uh, perceive speech. And these phonological representations are not necessarily the ones that we think of as these letters that we call phonemes, but actually uh, groups of phonemes that share uh, something in common, what we call features. And these, these are the members of small categories which combine to form the speech sounds of human language. This became very attractive to me as, as, as a model of something to look for in the brain because um, of essentially why it could be so important is that languages actually do not vary without limit, but they actually reflect some single or limited general pattern which is actually rooted in both the physical and cognitive capacities of the human brain and I would add the vocal tract. And this is a very, not a new kind of thinking, but it's one that has not been clearly elucidated uh, in terms of its biological mechanisms. So in order for us to get this information, um, it requires a very special opportunity. 
the one where we can actually record directly from the brain. And in many ways, this is actually a lot more coarse than the kind of recordings that were you know, done almost 25 years ago. These are ones from electrode uh, sensors that are placed on the brain in order to localize seizures in patients that have epilepsy. In the seven to 10 days that they are usually waiting to be localized, we have a very, again, precious opportunity to actually have some of the participant, the patient volunteers, listen to natural continuous speech as a, and look at those neural responses on these electrode recordings to see how information is distributed in the superior temporal gyrus when they're listening to these sounds. This gives you a sense of, of, of actually what that neural activity pattern looks like. We're going to go to green five now. We're going to slow down that sentence a lot here. Ready, tiger, go to green five now. So you can see that the information is being processed in a very precise, both spatial and temporal manner in the brain. And this is exactly the reason why this kind of information has been elusive, because we do not currently have a method that actually has both spatial and temporal resolution, and at the same time covers all of these, these areas simultaneously. And so uh, it's, again, in the context of these uh, rare opportunities with uh, human patient volunteers that we can conduct this kind of research. So the natural question is, of course, now that I've shown you that we can actually see a pattern in the brain, both that's temporally and uh, spatially specific, what actually happens when we try to deconstruct some of those uh, sound patterns uh, from the brain? And this just gives you an example, again, in the superior temporal gyrus, where those uh, sounds are activating the brain. <laughs> And uh, an example of the spectrogram for a given sentence, and in this case, it's in what eyes they were. And the last part of that figure basically shows you that pattern across different electrodes. It's not all happening in the same particular way. You have very specific evoked responses that actually occur at different parts of the superior temporal gyrus. And I want to show you what happens when you look at just one of those electrodes. And if you look at the neural response of that one particular electrode that's labeled E1, and you organize the neural response by different phonemes, okay? You can actually see, again, on the vertical axis, starting with da, ba, ga, pa, ta, ka, you can see that this electrode, those hundreds of or thousands of neurons that are under this electrode are very selectively responsive to this set of sounds that we call plosives. It's not one phoneme, but a category, and they share this feature that we actually know linguistically to be called plosive. I can show you a series of other electrodes. Uh, electrode two has a very different kind of sensitivity. It's showing you that it really likes those sounds, sh, za, sa, fa. This is an electrode that is, again, not tuned to one phoneme, but actually tuned to the category of sibilant fricatives in linguistic jargon. We have another electrode, E3, that is selective to low back vowels, these ah-based ones. Uh, another one that is a little bit more selective to uh, high-fronted vowels, E. And even uh, another electrode, E5, that is corresponding to uh, nasal sounds. So this is a very low-level description, but is actually the first time we've ever seen in this kind of principled way obtained through very precise spatial and temporal uh, recordings the ability to resolve phonetic feature selectivity at single electrodes in the human brain. Now, this is not enough. We need to really uh, address this issue of structure. Uh, that's one of the themes here. And are all of these things just equally distributed as features? In the original thinking about these things, you could have a binary list of of features, and it turns out that features in and of themselves actually have structure and have relationships with one another. And so what we did in order to look at that structure in the brain, we looked at hundreds of electrodes that were recorded over several, uh, over a dozen patients. And each one of those columns actually corresponds to one electrode in one particular uh, superior temporal gyrus uh, in, in someone's brain. And like I just showed you before, uh, the, um, the vertical axis is actually how they're organized by different phonemes. 
And what we did here was we used a statistical method called hierarchical clustering. And what a hierarchical clustering is, is used for is finding the patterns in this data. And what the hierarchical clustering showed us and sorted this data was that, in fact, there is indeed structure in the brain's responses to human speech sounds. And it looks like this. So we've organized the hierarchical clustering as a function of a single electrode, again, a single column's selectivity to different phonemes. But we've also organized this uh, clustering uh, as a population response across all of the electrodes um, and looking at that selectivity uh, for different phonemes. So you have two different axes that we're actually looking at the brain's large distributed response to speech sounds. And we're using this method, which is what we call unsupervised, meaning we're not telling it any linguistic information or we're not organizing the data. We're just saying, tell us how the brain is organizing this information. And what we see from this is that when we actually look at where this information is being organized, one of the biggest divisions between different parts of the different kinds of selectivity in the brain are what we would call the difference between consonants and vowels, or really actually between obstruence and, um, and uh, continuance um, in linguistic jargon. But within those different categories, you actually have subclassification. So within the consonants, you actually have a subdivision between plosives and fricatives. And between the sonorants, you actually have referencing for different positions of the tongue, low back, low front, high front, different classes of vowels, and in fact, nasal. So basically, this is telling you that feature selectivity in the brain is actually hierarchically structured. The second thing is that when, instead of using phonemes in order to organize the responses, we actually use uh, features. So uh, as an example, that term dorsal actually refers to uh, the tongue position when it's uh, fairly back, uh, like for ga, ka sounds. Um, and you can see that when we organize things by features, you have a much cleaner delineation. Uh, the electrode responses seem to be much more tuned to phonetic features shown below as they are compared to when you plot them as <coughs> phonemes. Okay, so this essentially disproves any idea that there is individual phoneme representation in the brain, at least not one that's locally encoded, but tells you that the brain is organized by its sensitivity to phonetic features. Now, relating it to a phonetic feature is the first step, and it's one that's really important because it's referencing the one that we, we know about from linguistics and the one that we know behaviorally. But how do we connect this to the physical stimulus that's actually coming through our ears? And that's where we have to make a linkage to actually something about the sound properties. Are these things truly abstract features that are being picked up by the brain? Or actually, are they referencing specific sound properties? And basically, the, the answer is the latter, is that what we're actually seeing is sensitivity to particular spectrotemporal features. When we, in the top row, I am showing you basically, when we look at the average tuning curves, the frequency versus time tuning curves for each one of those different classifications uh, for plosive fricatives, they're very similar to the acoustic structure when you average those particular phonemes in the brain. So what this means is the tuning that we're seeing that's corresponding to phonetic features is in fact one that is tuned to high order acoustic spectrotemporal ones. The brain is selecting specific kind of acoustic information and converting it into a f what we perceive as phonetic. In the interest of time, I'm going to sort of skip more in-depth information about you know, vowels and, and plosives and how those are specifically encoded. But in summary, what we found is that there's actually a multidimensional feature space actually for speech sounds in the human uh, superior temporal gyrus and that, there, uh, that this feature space is organized uh, in a way that actually shows hierarchical structure. And that um, the hierarchical structure is very, very strongly driven by the brain's, and in particular this auditory cortex sensitivity to acoustic differences, which are most signified actually in the manner of articulation uh, distinctions linguistically. And what's interesting about this is it actually does correlate quite well with uh, some known perceptual uh, behavior.
And so um, I would like to uh, con conclude there and acknowledge uh, some of the, the really important people from my lab, uh, postdoctoral fellow Nima Mascarani, who did most of this work with one of our graduate students, uh, Connie Chung. Thank you.